All right, well, tonight we're going to talk about God's way. You know, there's what, my way or the highway or God's way. Okay, let's go to John chapter 14. Now, I want to say something about this. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I'm seeing some, I saw this, some things in this as I studied this today that I have not seen before. And I'm not going to say that the way this is usually uh, explained is wrong, uh, but there's more to it than the way this usually gets explained. And I think that's what we're going to talk about here tonight, about God's way. Let me just read it down a little bit, and then we'll go back and pick up some things. Um, John chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on God. Believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, homes. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I am going away to prepare a place for you. And when I go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. And to that place where I'm going... You know the way. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Usually... I hear this passage quoted at a funeral. Especially that first verse. Don't let your heart be troubled. Uh, in my father's house are many mansions. Okay, and referring to, uh, you know, there's life after death. That if, if the spirit departs from, uh, uh, you know, your earth suit, that you go be with God in heaven. Okay, true, that's true. But is that all that he was saying there? No, or that, that's my my thesis tonight, is he wasn't just talking about dying and going to heaven when he, when he said these things. And when Thomas asked him about, well, where are you going? And, you know, he said, well, I'm the way to get there. Let's, we're going to talk about what all lies ahead in the future because heaven is not the ultimate destination uh, of the departed saints. Uh, he's coming back to this earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. And then after that, God's going to create a new place, a new heavens and a new earth. And it's real. And we don't know much about it. So, but, you know, just, just going, dying and going to heaven is not the end of the story. I mean, that's, that's wonderful to be in God's presence. You know, Paul said that. He said, well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So blessed are those who die in the Lord. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that or that that's not true. But that's not all this passage is talking about. Okay? So first of all, let, let's, let's deal with a couple of things here. And I don't think you all that I'm talking to here in the room... Uh, have this misconception. But, you know, he said, you believe in God, well, believe also in me. Well, a lot of people think, well, I believe in God. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God, so I'm okay with God. Well, that's not enough. I mean, he said that. He said, you believe in God. Remember, he's talking to his disciples who as yet are not born-again Christians. They're, they're Jews, okay? And they believe in God. Jews believe in God. I, I mean, you know, uh, most people on the planet would probably say they believe in a God. And, you know, they may call him by all kinds of different names, the great spirit, the great architect of the universe, uh, Allah, uh, you know, uh, Mahatma something or other. 
Gitchi Gumi or what, you know, I don't know. There's so many different names that people have for God, but that's not enough. Jesus is saying it's not enough just to believe in God. Let me give you scripture for this. Go to James chapter 2. Keep the place in John all the way through tonight. We're going to keep referring to this, this place here. And Jesus is not saying that, that you don't believe in God. He's not saying, well, well, don't believe in God, just believe in me. No, he said, you believe in God, that's good, but you need to believe also in me. And it's not good if you just say, well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. Well, in James chapter 2, verse 19, we read where it says... You believe that God is one, well, you do well, but so do the demons. The demons believe in God, and they shudder in terror. Um, and it's in the Amplified, it says, with, with a horror that makes a man's hair stand on end. <laughs> so just believing in God doesn't put you in right standing with him. You know, it says the fool says in his heart there is no God, and everybody on the planet's not a fool. So, you know, anybody that's not a fool believes in God, but we just read that that's not enough. And back in John, Jesus said that. He said, believe also in me. Well, I guess most Christians believe in him, but what is it exactly that we are believing when we believe Jesus, when we ask Him to be our Savior and our Lord, when we ask Him to come into our lives, what, what, are, we, what are we really signing up for here? Well, I'm going to give you two things. First of all, go to Matthew chapter 1. The first thing that we get when we ask Jesus into our hearts as, as we get a 24-7-365 hotline to God, that He is with us because that's what Jesus, that's a title that is given to Jesus. And we're going to read about it right here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place under these circumstances. When His mother Mary had been promised in marriage to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And her promised husband, Joseph, being a just and upright man, and not willing to expose her publicly to shame and disgrace by divorcing her, decided to quietly put her away, secretly. But as he was thinking this over, behold... An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this took place that it might be fulfilled which the Lord had spoken through the prophet. And that was in Isaiah where it says, Behold, the virgin shall become pregnant and will give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, I used to, to see verse 21 and verse 23 as as that he was trying to say the same thing in two different languages, but that's not what's going on here. Jesus means Savior, so he's our Savior. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's, what we, that's why we ask him into our life, is to save us, save us from our sin, right? But what it tells you there in verse 23 is it's not just that he is a, you know, a hero figure. He is God with us. And that's what the angel was trying to get across to Joseph is saying, hey, this, this, this uh, baby that Mary is pregnant with, this is not a normal thing. 
He, he is a supernatural divine being that is in her womb. He is God with us. You know, the Muslims believe Jesus lived. And they believe he died. They believe he rose again. Uh, but they don't believe he is divine. They don't believe he is God with us. So what Jesus over here in John chapter 14 is asking his disciples to do is, is he's making the point here that the angel made to Joseph is that he, Jesus, is God in human form. And God can do that because he's God. He can do anything. He can take on human form. All right, and then uh, another thing that we are believing, uh, go back to John chapter 1. You know, there are other places in the Bible where apparently Jesus, as another time, you know, like, like when he uh, appeared to Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace. He, it said he was walking with them and he, he was like the Son of God. So he appeared there, but that was hundreds of years before he's born now. So apparently he can, he can show up here in spirit form, but he showed up in physical form this time when he was born in, in Mary's womb. Well, why did he have to do that? He could, I mean, he could already show up and, you know, come and go and, you know, appear to somebody and, you know, do something miraculous and then poof, he's gone. So why, why didn't he do that that time? Because he was a sacrifice for our sin. And he was the only sacrifice that would cover all the sins of all people everywhere through all times. Because he's perfect. And it says this in John chapter 26. Uh, when John the Baptist met him, John chapter 1 verse 26. John the Baptist said in verse 26. I baptize you with water. But among you stands one whom you do not recognize and with whom you're not acquainted. And it is he coming after me who is preferred before me. The string of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And these things occurred in Bethany across from Jordan where John was baptizing. And the next day John saw Jesus coming to him and he said, look. There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So, that's why Jesus would tell his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. And then in the second verse, he says, well, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. Or I think the... the um, King James Version says, in my father's house are many mansions. And that's been talked about a lot in traditional, well, we've got a mansion over the hilltop. We've got a mansion in glory land. And, and we think of, you know, a big fancy house with a, you know, a golden staircase or whatever. And I'm not saying that that couldn't be. But that's really not, what the Greek word that's translated as mansions or dwelling places means. It actually means to be in a particular place, state, relationship, or expectancy. Right now, you are in a dwelling place with God. Right now, where you are. That's why you could say there's many dwelling places. Now, see, to the Jews, that was a strange concept because Jerusalem was the place they were supposed to go three times a year. They're supposed to go down there and offer their sacrifices at the feast days. And otherwise, life was kind of secular, but it was, it was holy those three times a year. 
Well, now he's saying, wherever you are, I'm there, so that's my dwelling place. But we've got to let him do it. But that said, he says, there's many, many dwelling places. And you don't have to be an American. You know, you don't have to be white. You don't have to be black. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be poor. You don't have to speak English. You don't have to speak Hebrew. <laughs> Where, whoever you are, if, if you call upon the name of Jesus, he said you'll be saved, and then he's there. He's with us. Emmanuel. Okay. Verse 3. Well, no. Right, let's finish up. He says, if it were not so, then I would have told you. He said, you know, if, if, if it's not going to be like that, that I can be wherever you are, then I would have told you, okay, you need to go to this place and you need to be in this situation, in this relationship or in this uh, kind of state or expectancy. He said, but I'm going away and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, tradition pretty much confines that to, well, he's going back to heaven to be with his heavenly father, which he is. No, no problem with that. But is, is that the place that he's going to prepare for us? Well, let's keep reading. He said, uh, that where I am, you may be also. Well, if he's coming back to rule and reign in this earth, aren't we going to be with him here too? All right. And in verse 3 he says, And when I go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again. Now that's talking about the second coming. I will come back again where? To earth. And, and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. Well, Jesus explained this a little bit in some parables that he told. Keep the place here in John. Go to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19 verse 11. Now, they were listening to these things and Jesus proceeded to tell a parable because he was approaching Jerusalem and they thought that the kingdom of God was going to be brought to light and shown forth immediately. And so he said, A certain nobleman went into a distant country to obtain for himself a kingdom and then to return. All right, and then he, he called his servants uh, and he each gave them a certain amount of money and said, buy and sell with these uh, and then I will, I will go and then I will return. But the citizens of that place where he was detested him and sent an embassy after him saying, well, we do not want this man to become ruler over us. Well, see, that's what the people of, of Israel did when he came the first time. Okay, but then he says, when he returned, he's coming back to this earth, see? When he returned, after having received the kingdom, then he ordered the bond servants that he had given the money uh, to be called so he would know how much uh, each one had made from the buying and selling. And... I'm not going to go into the rest of the parable there other than to point out that the kingdom of the, the millennial kingdom, the kingdom reign of Jesus Christ is in this earth when he comes back. But meanwhile, the kingdom is in us. It says that in Luke chapter 17. Verse 20. Luke 17, verse 20. Asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Now, you would have thought he would have said, well, when I come back. 
And most people say, well, you know, he didn't even really tell us when he was going to come back. The, the apostles thought he was going to come back within 40 years, and it's been 2,000. Well, you know, with the, the Lord, a day is as 1,000 years, and 1,000 years as a day. So let's not get hung up on how long that's been. But he didn't even say, when I come back, the kingdom's going to come. He said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed or with a visible display, nor will people say, look, here is the kingdom of God, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your hearts and among and surrounding you. So really, the kingdom of God is already working with us now. I mean, it, it's not at its full power. It'll be at full power when Jesus comes back. But it's already, it's already available to us now. That's what he's saying. And it says, some will say, look, um, he says, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look, uh, there he is, or look, but do not go out and follow them. For as the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so will be the Son of Man on his own day when he returns. Okay, back to John chapter 14. See, he's not just saying, okay, you're going to die someday, and, and then, uh, then I'm going to take you to heaven. I mean, okay, he will do that, those who die in Christ. But that's not the only thing he was prophesying here. Okay, verse um, 4. And to the place where I am going, you know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And he said, well, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So about the best uh, way we could say where he's talking about is in the presence of the Father, at the, the throne of God. Okay, that's where he's going, right, right then. But what does that mean for us here and now? Well, keep the place here. Go to, well, go to, to Psalm 110. This verse right here is one of the most quoted verses from the Old Testament in the New Testament. I think it's quite, I, I've counted 26 times in the New Testament that Psalm, the 110th Psalm is quoted in the New Testament. And it says, The Lord God says to my Lord, the Messiah, Jesus, Sit at my right hand until... I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, so that's where he was going, and then he's going to come back from there. So that's where he is. Well, where is that? Well, let's let's kind of let's kind of discuss what goes on with that first. Uh, go to Mark chapter sixteen. This is often called the Great Commission. And it, it's that. It was what he said to his disciples before he ascended to God's throne after his resurrection. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 14. It says, Afterwards he appeared to the eleven 
as they reclined at table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they had refused to believe those who had said that they had seen him after he had risen. And then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach and publish openly the good news, the gospel, to every creature under the whole of the human race. And he who believes and who is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe uh, will be condemned. And these signs... Uh, These attesting signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will, if they pick up, even if they pick up serpents or drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. And, of course, all of those things happened in the first century. In fact, they didn't stop happening in the first century. So, anyway, but, but verse 19 is what I really want you to see. Then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Well, okay, what's, what's he doing? Just sitting there? <laughs> no, it tells you what he's doing in 1 John chapter 2. First John 2, verse 1. My little children, I write you these things so that you may not violate God's law and sin. But if anyone should sin, we have an advocate, one who intercedes for us with the Father. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous, who conforms to the Father's will in every purpose, thought, and action. Now that would be a full-time job to intercede for us with the Father. So if, that, if he's at the Father's right hand now, that's what he's doing. And then there's something else that is said about that. Go to Acts chapter 3. Acts 3, verse 21. Uh, No, let's start verse 19. So, repent, change your mind and purpose, turn around, return to God, that your sins may be erased, blotted out and wiped clean, that times of refreshing, of recovering from the effects of heat and the reviving with fresh air may come from the presence of the Lord. Now that's interesting, isn't it? That it's saying that there's some things that can come to us here in this realm that come from that other realm. You know, that other realm is, is, is a superior realm to this one. In fact, everything that's in this one originated in that realm. So, you know, if, if we're thinking, oh, if it's spiritual, oh, that's nothing, we've got that backwards. You know, it even says in, in 2 Corinthians that the physical things are just temporary, that the spiritual things are eternal. Anyway, let's keep reading. And it says that he will send you Christ, the Messiah, who was designated and appointed beforehand. Jesus, whom heaven must receive and did receive until the time of complete restoration of all the things God has spoken by the mouth of all of his prophets for ages past from the most ancient time in the memory of man. 
Now, that's a lot of stuff. And it says that God is going to fulfill all of the prophecy. And then Jesus is going to come back. Okay, but back to John chapter 14. There's this thing that, that I used for the title. He uses this term, I am the way. The way to the Father. Well, that's an interesting choice of words because it means one thing in Greek, it means something else in Hebrew. In Greek, the word way really means the road, the, the, the path to travel. But it doesn't just mean a, a route. It can also mean uh, the way that you get there. You know, like you can get there in a car or you can get there in a plane or in a bus. You might take a bus, you might take a train, but if you have to walk, you're going to get there just the same. But we're not going to Kansas City. Okay, we're going to, we're going to the presence of God, right? Okay, but in Hebrew, the word actually means to walk. It's simply walk, to tread. Now that, that has some additional meaning, I think, for our lives now because, you know, if we say, well, it's the, it's the travel or it's the means of travel, we think, well, we're going to get in a car and we're going to go 60, 70 miles an hour and we're going to get there pretty quick or get in a plane and go hundreds of miles an hour. But if it's walking then that, that and at treading at that, I mean, that's, that's like unto work, isn't it? So it's not easy. More like going back to school. Or like going back to school. There you go. Yes. Yes. Okay. We'll go to Nahum in the Old Testament. And let's see what God has to say about way there. Because this describes, I think, our relationship with him pretty accurately. And it also is an, an accurate picture, I think, of the world right now that we're living in. And what's about to happen in our world right now. Okay, Nahum chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle concerning Nineveh that God showed Nahum of Elka, Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous God and avenges. He is full of wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Well, you know, right there, Ellen, that kind of describes why your, your friend can be assured it's not God punishing her because she is not God's enemy. See, people say this sometimes. They say, well, this bad thing happened. God's punishing me. Well, are you his enemy? If you're not his enemy, then he's not punishing you. In fact, his enemies are spirit beings anyway. But those who have um, aligned their lives with the devil and with his spirits, they don't have anything good to look forward to. And that's what this is telling us right here. But uh, it says, verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will no means clear the guilty. The Lord has his way. Okay, there's that word. He has his way in the whirlwind and in the storms and the clouds are dust at his feet. I want to show y'all with y'all a little thing that happened to me the other day when I was out running. A lot of times when I go out running, jogging, treading, <laughs> I do this for exercise several, you know, five times a week or whatever it is. Um, and I pray. That's what I do when I'm out there. It's my, that's my quiet time. That's my prayer closet is when I go out on the trail and run. And I was praying for this guy that I don't know. I've never met him. I've just seen some of his things on the Internet. And, 
and I, I had seen where he was saying he was going to have to go through surgery uh, sometime this week. And so, and I got to praying, and I mean, it was really an anointing came upon me, and I was really praying intensely. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, I heard this loud rumble of, of sound there where I was, and there was a sign down at, you know, a little, little ways in front of me that began to start rattling, and it was just moving back and forth, and I thought, what in the world's going on here? And then all of us, all of a sudden I saw it. There was one of these little whirlwinds that was just kicking up dust. And it was right after I had finished saying amen about that prayer. And then this whirlwind comes. And it's, I, and it's like, oh, I better get out of the way of this thing. And, and I just felt like, no, I think that the Lord was showing me a sign. That he was answering that prayer that I had prayed. Because, you know, I was really, I was really intense in it. And he says that he has his way in the whirlwind. Remember what it was that picked up Elijah and carried him off to heaven while he was still in his body? It's a whirlwind. So, uh, then verse 4 it says, He rebukes and threatens the sea and makes it dry. You know, he's done that. He dr dried the... Uh, the Red Sea, and he dried the River Jordan, and he's going to dry the River Euphrates, and he dries rivers. And uh, Bashan and Mount Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. All of these things are symbols of the, the, the goodness and the blessings of the world, the natural realm, the, the, the bounty of the earth. You know, and if, if all we are looking for is something earthly for our blessings, for our prosperity, for our needs to be met, then they're going to fail. I mean, we're seeing this happen in slow motion right before our eyes. We're seeing this happen right here. And it says, The mountains tremble and quake before him. The hills melt away. And the earth is upheaved at his presence. Yes, the world and all that's in it. This right here is just a little thumbnail sketch of what the book of Revelations talks about in chapter after chapter, right? Who can stand before his indignation? And who can stand and endure the fierceness of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken asunder by him. But then it says in verse 7, The Lord is good. He is strength and a stronghold in the day of trouble. So even though all of that judgment is coming, he's not saying we need to be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled. See what Jesus was telling his disciples. The Lord is good. He knows and recognizes those who take refuge and trust in him. Good to know. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make a full end of Nineveh's very sight and pursue his enemies with darkness. And what do you devise? And how mad is your attempt to plot against the Lord? He will make a full end of Nineveh. And the affliction which my people suffer shall not rise up a second time. Now, I want to say something else here. You can let the place in John 14 go. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I understand why people would be concerned that, that they might have offended God and therefore something bad has happened. You know, I mean, it does say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So for, for me to make the, the point about Ellen's friend, wondering if she had offended God. That's not a bad question to ask. Even though God is saying, you know, if you trust in Him, He's not going to be hurting you. 
that there, there's, um, there's a couple of scriptures I could give you there. Um, you know, like he says with him, that there's no fear in his love because fear brings torment. And the word for torment means to inflict uh, damage upon. God doesn't do that. The devil's the one that does that. But I do understand why when, when people are not as close to God as we need to be, why we would be kind of afraid of, his, of him. You know, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they were afraid. They, they hid from him. And here in 2 Corinthians, it talks about this, but it gives us an interesting, an interesting insight on that thing that I'm talking about there. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph. I had someone ask me on Sunday, well, does God ever tell you no if you ask him for something? Well, I guess it really kind of depends on what you're asking and how you're asking it. If, you know, it says if you ask to consume it on your lust, then no, God would tell you no. But if you're asking, you know, Jesus said if you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a serpent, uh, you know. And if, if you ask for fish, he's not going to give you a scorpion. So... So he knows, he knows what you need before you ask, and he's, he's always good. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I think it is, where he says that, um, that the Son of God is always uh, yes. It's not, he doesn't say yes and then turn around and say, well, no. And sometimes people think that that's, that's happened. They say, well, well, God said he'd do this, and then he took it away from me. No, that's, that's not right. Anyway, he always leads us in triumph. The answer to prayer is always an improvement. It says, and we are then trophies of Christ's victory. And through us he spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. Now, the, the use of the term fragrance here is interesting. I mean, I guess maybe it, it actually could be some, something that smells sweet or doesn't smell sweet, but I think it's, it's a metaphor because if it smells sweet, it's like, oh, you enjoy it and you like it, but if it, doesn't smell, if it smells bad, oh, oh, it's repulsive. You don't, you don't want to be around that, right? Well, that's what he's talking about here, but... It, how, how you smell depend to another person depends on where they're at with God. Because it says, <clears throat> We are a fragrance of Christ which exhales unto God, discernible alike among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the ones who are perishing, we smell like an aroma of death, a fatal odor, a smell of doom. Well, why would that be? You know, it seems kind of odd. He's saying, well, they're dying, and, and we're, we're, we have the odor of Christ, so why wouldn't we smell like life to someone who's dying? Because the person who's dying is not deriving their life from, from Christ, because God, they are at, they are an enemy of God. They are at odds with God. So they smell judgment when they get around us. They smell, oh no, God's gonna, God's gonna wipe, wipe me dead. I don't want to get around them because then I feel uneasy. Okay, that's why we smell like death. If you know, but in fact, in the world, in the flesh, the things that make people feel uh, victorious are really stuff that will kill you, you know, alcohol and drugs and, and, and partying and just having a good time and an abundance of food and abundance of money and just, you know, idolatry. And in the end, an idol will kill those who worship it. So, so of course, somebody that, that's running after all of that and then you just say the name of Jesus, it's like, no, no, don't bring that in here. Right? That's, not, that's, that's no fun. You're a party pooper. You're a killjoy. Right? Well, of, well, of course. 
because they're not, they're not, uh, they're perishing. The stuff that, that makes them feel good is killing them. And you're giving them something that's going to give them life. Remember Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Well, something else about the truth. If people don't want the truth, then when you give them the truth, it's going to sound wrong. It's going to sound evil. It's going to sound hurtful. You know, and what will make them feel happy and feel good, well, we'll get down to that in verse 17, is something that, that tantalizes them, it, it, that even lies to them, makes them feel good. It says, to the latter, we are an aroma of death, but to the former, that is to those who are in Christ, we are a living fragrance, vital and fresh. And who's qualified for these things? This is not something you can fake. If, if God is in you, then you're going to smell godly, and if God not in you, you're not. Simply put. And it's, but here in verse 17, he talks about those who try to fake it. He said, well, we're not like so many hugsters making a trade of peddling God's word, shortchanging and adulterating the divine message. See, that's trying to make the gospel sound appealing to the flesh. And, okay, you know, their motive might even be not so bad. As they, 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 you know, they love Jesus and they want everybody to love Jesus. So, but do you, do you manipulate people into it or do you, do you water it down or do you sugarcoat it or you try to do something else to entice them to come to Jesus? He didn't do that. He told the truth. He said, no, but with like men of sincerity and with purest motive and commissioned and sent by God, we speak his message in Christ in the very sight and presence of God. Well, I, I try to do that. And, and I will say that is a tall order there. And, and anybody who's going to minister, in fact, any Christian, you don't even have to be a pastor or a, a teacher or, or a missionary or something else. Any Christian should make that their aim to try to live with the utmost of sincerity and, and the purest motive. And that's what we try to do here. So, Father, I thank you for your word, and, and I thank you, Father, that this message doesn't fall on deaf ears, but that, that we will, all of us, will, will seek to, to be doers of this word and, and not just hearers. And, Father, I thank you, for showing us the, the, the path for us to, to tread in this life. And that, that even if the way gets rough or, or if the, 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 the path gets rocky, that you're still right there with us and that, that it, like the footprints in the sand, if we get tired, you'll pick us up and carry us. And so we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.